Good afternoon. My name is John Pecor, and you're here today at the Northern New York Agricultural Historical Society. This is the museum in Stone Mills. We're located about 20 miles east of Lake Ontario and about 13 miles from the Canadian border. This is a tiny little hamlet, and this is just a wonderful museum, and we're so glad that you've joined us. I'm joined here today by Alton Jones, who is the director of this museum. Alton, welcome. Good afternoon. Afternoon, John. And so we're going to take some a, a nice tour of the museum. Hopefully, uh, we, we've got about 14 buildings situated on 20 acres of land, and those 14 buildings are all just chucked right full of archives and, and antiques that are actually centered around the agricultural business of here in Jefferson County over the last 19th and 20th century. So we're going to start right now. Okay, here we find ourselves at the church. This is the combined church. Uh, this was the original base piece for the museum, and this was the museum at the very beginning until all the extra uh, acreage and buildings were added. This is, of course, once again the original, and this is the original bell. This church burnt twice, and so consequently from the fire, this was the only piece that was salvaged, and they decided not to put it up in the steeple again. So now we're going to go inside the church and take a look. Now we find ourselves inside the church. This is a wonderful old church built in 19, or 18, excuse me, 1836, as and it was called the Union Church of Stone Mills, which might indicate that it was used by more than one parish and possibly even more than one denomination. There might have been Baptists and Methodists, maybe even a Lutheran group, and maybe even Catholics that would come here and share this building. After all, in those days, maintaining a large building like this was a considerable effort, and it would have required more than just one congregation to support it, keeping it heated, and because it had to be heated all the time, not just when there was a service. So very possibly they might have two or three or even four services a week in this building with a population in the area so sparse they would have to use it for more than one congregation, and therefore it's called the Union Church. In, eight, in 1968, this building was put on the National Historic Register of Important Buildings, and therefore we're not allowed to change it an awful lot, but we are in a process right now of trying to restore it and bring it back to its original specter. And, and so that being the case, the, the museum is, is making a major effort to, to raise a considerable amount of money. It's going to require new windows and it's going to require a new roof. And there's just so much that has to be done just to preserve this wonderful building. We're located in, in one of three large implement buildings that are just chucked right full of implements and, and things that were used by our parents, our grandparents, and their grandparents. Let's start with this very first piece that Alton has got his hand on. That's called a, uh, a hay tether. Now, when hay, of course, a lot of farmers would lose their barns because they put in wet hay. And if it rained the night that they, they mowed the hay, they would have to wait till it dried on top, and then they would take a horse and drag this machine over the hay, and it would pick it up and fluff it, much like a lady was, was uh, teasing her hair. And that's, that's what this job did. This sits on top of a pair of bobs. Now, every farmer had a set of bobs, and they would use them on Saturday to go to store, and as they went down the road, Everybody would come out and say, well, gee, if Vern is going to the store, have him pick up something uh, for me, some, a bag of flour, or have him pick up some sugar, or you never know. They might even hitch a ride to church on the bobs. It became a regular community pastime to go for a ride on a set of bobs. Behind Alton here, we have quite a few plows. We've got a, a, a potato hiller, number two. Number three is a, is a potato digger. And number four, this one also as a hiller. Standing here in front of me is a potato digger. This would be usually take two horses to pull this and it would actually pull the soil up and it would ride up on these treadles and they would shake the dirt off and then leave the potatoes on the back. 
Right behind that, we have a potato grater. So for someone who maybe sold some potatoes, they would use that to actually grade the potatoes and they would divide them into two or three groups. So the, the premium ones would fetch a little bit more money. Of course, we've all seen these setting in front yards these days. This is a mowing machine. They normally have a longer tongue. This one has been cut off to be used with a tractor. But when they, were mowed, when they mowed with them with horses, they would have a long tongue that would reach up and catch the uh, eveners on the front of, uh, or front of horses. This is a cedar that we have here. And we're moving right up this, this uh, some, uh, oh, let's see, what do we call that? Pulverizers. And of course, they would also be horse drawn. And we've got a payback insulage cutter. When farming first began and, and they uh, brought the corn in from the field, they didn't chop it as they do today. They would chop it, just they would chop it off. Maybe they would use a sickle and they would tie it off, throw it on the wagon, and when they would get to the barn, they would blow it into the silo by throwing it one bundle at a time into this and it would chop it right here. In contrast to today, it's chopped in the field and brought into the barn in massive wagons. And this is another pay pack. These were very popular at the turn of the century because they were so handy and they did the job of many men. This is a corn cultivator. All of these implements that we see here have all been relegated to rest. They've all done their job over and over and over. And I often think about the many families that got their subsistence just by learning how and able to maintain these, this equipment and it, it gave them subsistence. However, we have one piece that hasn't earned its place in rest yet and this is our binder. This binder we use every year here at the museum. We have a farmer that nearby, he uses our land and he puts in seed and then at the end of the summer we will actually use the binder. Two or three of the boys will gather together, they'll hook onto it, take it out into the field and they'll bind up grain, whichever grain, whether it's barley or oats or winter wheat, and then we will go ahead and stook it up. We, some folks call it stooking, some folks call it uh, um, another name, stuffing or stumping, but my family always called it stooking. And you'd take the grain after it came off of this, it would go up there and tie it into small bundles, and then it would leave it in a pile. Manually, you would have to go out on the field pick them all up and put them together into groups and they would stand and dry for a couple of weeks and that's the favorite courier and eyes pictures that we often see little they look like little hots all over the field and they are stooks of grain drying once they dry then we can go and and load them on a wagon and they can be sent to the thrasher which we'll see in just a few minutes I'm standing here with a water wheel this was located right here in Stone Mills, right down at the bottom of the hill. There's a creek that runs through here. And from what the old timers tell me, uh, this actually would powder, powered a grist mill. There was a small dam right, right here in Stone Mills, and they, they had a grist mill. Well, many years, this powered the grist mill. Well, at some point, the building collapsed, and after a while, the mechanisms that, that made their their fortunes also fell into disrepair. So this was actually dragged out of the creek and has been salvaged and brought up here to the museum. 103. Yes, well here we are in the kitchen area. This isn't a really large area, but it seems to be one of the favorites when the schools send students around and we explain to them that you just looked at the, uh, the hand pump and the hand pump, they really get a hoot when we tell them the water comes from a big tank in the basement, which is generated from the heat troughs off the roof. And they say, what? You don't have regular well water? No, you have to pump it up yourself. And that would be one of the jobs that the kids would have to do, is pump up the water. And mom would use water in the kitchen just from that tank in the basement. We're seeing an all sudden an old-fashioned wood stove, and this is what mom would, would use to cook with, and that's another job that the students or the kids would have to take care of. They'd have to bring in the wood and tend the fire, and of course that fire was kept 24 hours a day, and if it was to go out, of course, there would be no dinner or lunch or breakfast. 
That's part of their job. As you can see, there's, there's way too much stuff for me to, to explain. I'm confident that every one of you that have ever been to your grandparents probably saw much of this stuff when you went to their house. They are in the kitchen. This is the inside of a, of a typical grocery store. Uh, keeping in mind there weren't any major grocery stores uh, back at the, uh, in the 19th century. So consequently, every grocery store served as the community center. Notice we've got the checkerboard and we've got uh, numerous crocks and pickle jars and cracker boxes and dehumidifiers. Behind me stands, this is the ice box. This is where the meat and the cheese was kept. Uh, folks would come in and they would they would get them they would get their cheese, and it would usually be taken out of one of those major blocks, and we'd, it would be each day the ice man would come and he would put fresh blocks of ice down, and that kept everything cold as best we could. When they were cutting the cheese, they would put it on this here, which is really interesting. Set the block down, and you would ask the customer. How much do you want? And you say, well, I want one pound, or they would just take it and turn it until you'd say, is that enough? Yep, that's just about right. And then they would take, and they would push that down, and then they would take that off, put it on the scale over here, and weigh it up, and that's what they would pay. It would always be right on the scale. These, all these artifacts have been given to us by small grocers right here in Jefferson County. And we're so happy that we're able to put them all back so that we can see how it operated. If you see, uh, they sold everything, as you can clearly see. Uh, just, just behind the camera now is the dentist chair and also the barber shop and also the post office. That was definitely the community center. Everything is one-stop shopping. the mother is busy doing so many things during the day and so she's also rocking the children and giving them giving them a, a nap as she's probably turning pancakes or maybe running the wash machine over there she could be doing one two or three things or she could put a smaller a, a larger child to work just keeping the baby happy this piece of equipment here it's not something that we would see in every household, but many households you'd see it. If, if you had a big dog and you also wanted to run a fruit press or if you wanted to run a washing machine or even hook it up to a cradle, you'd bring the dog up on the treadle and you would tie something off, maybe a little piece of meat, and he would lean against this and he would start running and it would cause this drive wheel to spin. And when that would spin, hook it up to a wash machine or you would hook it up to even a sewing machine. And it would be utilizing the dog, and after a while, he would get accustomed to it, very much like a donkey or even an oxen on the bigger machines. This is all this is, it's just a dog treadle. Most farms would have a fruit press. This we could put in, put in uh, fruits of any kind, apples, cherries, berries of any sort, and make a mush out of them, making them ready for canning. Uh, everybody had to preserve fruits as best they could. Most of it was canned, and so most, most farms had a fruit press of one sort or another to make cider to drink through the winter months or to even pre help preserve the fruits in the, in the neighborhood. And there was always at least one in the neighborhood, a fruit press. It's is all about laundry. Now we had several, of course, we would see, uh, we would have a scrub board which is down here. I could pull that up in the scrub board. We've all seen these in operation. Mother would end up scrubbing the clothes, and then running them through the wringer, and then we'd go into clear water, and they would clean them off, getting them ready to hang up. But there was also other ways. This is a washer that uh, we don't see often, but if mom was busy taking care of the baby, she would also be washing the clothes. They would be inside of this, and this is an agitator inside. 
and it was actually just cleaning the clothes. We are doing two or three things at once. Or if one of the kids was mischievous, we could put him to work doing that. And here's another washer that we we'll put the clothes in there and you just agitate it. And this could be hooked also to the crib or the cradle, rocking the baby as well as maybe even doing some ironing. You can be doing the clothes. It's once we get into the uh, out, out in with where the cream is separated, we made butter the same method, and we'll see that a little bit later in this video. This was a clothes washer. So apparently, once again, we prepare the water in this tub and agitate it, such a method, and that would uh, more or less get the clothes clean. This one's a handmade job. Once again, it's, it serves the same purpose as the one we looked at earlier. Seeing all these scrub boards, it's little wonder that mothers didn't have a lot of fingernails in those days, and probably why they prize them so much today. With all these artifacts that are now at rest, I can clearly see that I would, it would have been tough on the nails. Here's another washer here. This one, this one had a motor at one time, and it would agitate the same with its own, with its own ringers. There were many stories of when children were small, their mothers were, would just be after them, not to get their fingers near this. Many children lost their fingers because of the of the ringers that would just ring the water right out of the clothing. And of course this is a nice new one. This display is, has been set here. It's not, it's not in display. Now when the children come from school we usually take this entire display out to a, to a laundry center and the kids are able to actually wash feed bags or anything they decide to wash, whether it's hankies or or maybe uh, some little scarf, and they'll wash it, and then they'll get to, they'll get to use this stuff, which is, which is great fun for them. They can go home and say they actually did some laundry. I'm confident that their parents are just ecstatic to think that actually happened. We find ourselves in the, in the rural carpenter's shop. This would also be the blacksmith shop. And you know, the, the blacksmith had to be the, the master of all trades. He was not only was working with wood, but he was also working with molten metal, heating up metal, making it into all sorts of things. The average farmer didn't go to the store and buy boxes of nails or hinges. He would go to the blacksmith shop and they would make nails and they would make hinges. They would make all the things that he needed. Behind me is some fine examples of, of uh, uh, nails that the blacksmith would make while he had nothing else to do. He would, he would putter around maybe in the evenings just making nails or he would get in order to make hinges or he would make horseshoes, all kinds of things. He was always busy as everyone in that day would have to be. Work all day long, all day. This, these pieces above me, these artifacts above me are, are so important in, in 18 histories, the 18th century actually, moving across the prairies for the Canastota wagons. Each wagon would carry one of these, and what they are, are jacks. They would be actually used to lift the wagon up in case there was a broken wheel or, or the axle broke or anything, any problems with the wheel. They couldn't afford to be out in the middle of the wilderness and be running on three wheels. So every wagon carried a jack with them, just as we do in our cars today. But they're not very recognizable as jacks, but they're very fun. We find ourselves... We're passing by the tractor shed. This is something new this last few years. Uh, that used to be a barbecue. And we had barbecued chicken and barbecued this and barbecued that. But in the last year or so, the state has recognized the fact that that the floor wasn't steel, so consequently we decided that we probably hadn't, uh, because it's so close to other buildings, we decided to use it for something else. So we took the barbecue out and we decided to make it a display for tractors. Well, as you can clearly see, it's doing its job. Okay, we find ourselves here in the implement building, stumbling over so much 
wonderful stuff, but we, we, we happen to walk up to this 1919 New York Air Brake. It's called a three-point truck. This truck was made in the New York Air Brake in Watertown, New York. In 1919, it's called a three-point because it had no point. It had two, eh, two uh, swivels in the back and one swivel in the front. So it was a solid axle, and that's what gave it its name. This truck transported castings from the New York Air Brake to Buffalo twice weekly. Notice these hard rubber tires. I can't imagine what the roads were like in 1919, but I'm told it made two trips a week to Buffalo and back carrying a load of castings over and then picking up a load of heat treated castings to bring them back. This truck was also featured. This is the last remaining one of these of, of six. There were six of these made. This is the last remaining one. It's motorized. We drive it, not often, probably once a year. We will start it up, we will back it out, and we will have it join the parade of vehicles here at the museum. But back at some point in its history, there was a, a group of area farmers wanting to please one of our presidents, uh, made a 3,000 pound block of cheese called the Big Cheese. And they loaded it on this truck and they sent it to Washington. And so now it ends up here. The New York Air Brake found that they didn't have space for it any longer and it's on permanent loan here at the museum. Okay, we're looking at a stationary hay press. This, uh, there weren't many of these around and usually a group of farmers would own this and operate it. It would take three or four people to operate at the minimum. And usually the, the farm boys, the country boys, would be, would be called in to put the hay in the top. It would, be, it would be pitched out of the hay mows and pitched in the top. And then they would jump on it to get it to come down. And then uh, there would be a large uh, crankshaft affair that the team of horses would hook to. And as they walked around, they would cause that upper plunger to come down and press the hay. When it got all the way to the bottom, they would feed these wires through and they would end up with a bale very much like that one sitting in the corner right there. That's the one bale that we have left over. Once again, this is another piece that has been relegated to rest. It's just, it's done its job over many, many years. And they would usually take this from farm to farm to press hay, getting it ready for sale. They wouldn't, they wouldn't press hay to be used on the farm, but they would press hay to be used to load onto, usually on flatbed rail cars, and be taken for sale. Look at, looking up above, there's a small cable car hanging from a, from a beam up there, and just this side of the cable car, I'm going to point to it with this broomstick so that we can see what we're looking at. There's, this is called a diamond right here that I just tapped. Right there, that's called a diamond. When that little cable car would approach that diamond, it would lock onto it, and when that happened, it would actually drop this set of forks. They would drop right out, that pulley would drop, and it would drop right down. Usually, the, the hay wagon would come underneath it, loaded with hay, and when that dropped, whoever was on the wagon, they would take the forks, shove them into the hay as far as they could, and then they would turn this handle, right here, and that would cause these little feet, these spears, to crank up and become just like a fish hook. And they would actually become barbs, and then the, the process would reverse the tractor or the team of horses that would be standing outside, hooked to the cable, the rope, as you can clearly see, would start to shorten. It would cause that pulley to head back up into the cable car, and whoop into the cable car, and once it got to the cable car, which was locked onto the diamond, it would release it from the diamond, and it would travel to the back of the barn. It got to the back of the barn, and there would be a rope tied to this handle. It would release this, these barbs would straighten out, and it would drop its load in the hayloft. And that's how they got loose hay up into the barns. It was an arduous process, and very dangerous, but at the same time, that was before mow elevators and baled hay. At the turn of the century, into the 18th, 19th century, 
we were, we're looking at scythes, scythes and gathering scythes. Originally there were only scythes, and even now we, we see pictures of, uh, even in Europe, all over Europe and, and Asia, they would use just a scythe to, to gather hay. And of course, then there would always be uh, many people coming through and scooping it up in their arm lengths and stooping it up or loading it into, into piles and, and making big hay mounds. And then eventually, we, we moved to a gathering site, which would be uh, with all the extra teeth on them. I should have a pointer, pointer and I don't. Uh, the extra teeth, and that would leave it in piles as opposed to just leaving it scattered about. It would leave it in piles. It would be easier to gather up, taking a, a, a handful of the hay, wrapping it around it, and actually making a, a, a pile or a stook so it could be easily handled, very much like baling today. Next came the rake. This rake was, this is what, six feet. Six feet wide. It would usually be pulled by one horse, sometimes two, but normally one horse could do the job and the rider would ride on it and he would dump the, the hay into, as soon as it got full, he would dump it into a windrow and eventually the windrow would go the whole length of the field. It would be just like a long worm of hay and after this you would dump it and then move on to the next windrow and you would gather the hay in the next windrow and once again it would dump and it would leave it there and you'd do the whole field into long windrows of hay waiting for a hay lower, which is down the, down the way a bit. We're going to look at that. It's a wonderful piece of the equipment. So th that's, that's what we're going to approach now, if we can. This is a hay lower. I know it's difficult to see with all the other artifacts close at hand to it, but this would, this would straddle the hay wet, the, the, hay, the wind roll, and actually would go over it and pass right over it. And I know there are other pieces in the way, but this would go over it. And as it got underneath, there were a set of a whole big um, drum of, of uh, forks that would actually cause the hay to come up in and ride on the other side of this. And there were all of these um, oh, kind of like fingers, paws. They would move the hay up and keep pushing the hay up, just like a, you'd see a cat uh, itching your back or something. They would push the hay to the top and it would get way up to the top, and then it would fall off onto the wagon, which was pulling it. And that's when you would end up with a, a full load of, of loose hay. And that was before bales, of course. And then, of course, we worked our way into this situation right beside us. This is a, ba a baler. This is an Alice Chalmers baler. And they were very popular for a few years. Um, according to what my dad said, their downfall was the fact that they didn't make a really large bale. They made a small bale, they made it round and usually four feet long. And when the farmers would store the hay in these round bales, in their barn they would have a tendency, the settling effect would cause the barn to expand. And it, it was kind of the demise of many barns by using these small bales. Eventually they outwore their usefulness and the, the square bales came into effect, and they were square bales that the average man on the farm could pick up and handle by hand. And so it was easy to stand, they would stack by themselves, just like cinder blocks or, or chimney bricks. They stood and you could make great big piles out of square bricks. Consequently, the square baler, New Holland and uh, Massey Harris, Massey Ferguson's, they all became very, very popular. And now we've gone even to the larger, the big uh, ton, two ton hay bales, but still the smaller bales are still very popular. Um, when it came to grain, we're, we found ourselves in another situation. Uh, the old style was to use a binder. There's a binder here someplace. This replaced the gathering scythe. These would drop down and sweep that area and so it would sweep off a group of, of grain each time and then people could come along and pick it up and stook it. Once again, it would be the same process. So this replaced the gathering scythe and then of course after that it was, uh, we moved uh, to the binder which we looked at earlier, there's one up there, that actually would tie it up. And then we would stook it up and then eventually it would end up in this. We've all seen these. This, of course, is a thrashing machine. And 
this was also a three or a four person operation. You would have to have two or three people feeding it. You would have to have one person just keeping the power coming to it. Usually it was pulled down the road with a steam engine or some kind of a big belt driven tractor that would drag it down the road and he would stop at each farm and everybody would pitch in together. It was a grand time because that meant everybody was going to have the best of food. They were always felt and fed well. Lots of pies and, and mashed potatoes and the whole business because it was the working crew. I can hear my mom saying right now, here come the men. And they would come and they would be dragging this grand old thrashing machine. We're very fortunate here at this museum. We have five thrashing machines. When you have five, it's kind of like having five elephants. They're wonderful, but what do you do with them? <laughs> but they're a great display. This is a thrashing machine. This would separate the, the oats from the chaff and the, and the hay. It would feed it in there, and it would just beat it up in the air, just keep beating it up until all the grain dropped down into the bottom, and the pulleys would drive this, this, this um, fan, and it would cause the wind to blow the chaff out. It would come out this great tube here, blow it out into a great uh, pile, and then the, the grain would come out, and they would bag it up, and it would take it to the granary. Okay. This piece is an antique uh, manure spreader, or honey wagon as they called them. This was a honey wagon. This one is unique in that most of them today, and even uh, into the 20th century, had just treadles moving the manure back to these beaters. But this one, the whole floor moved. The whole floor ro rotated on, on, on three chains, and the whole floor fed the manure right back into these beaters, and they would actually break it up and spread it around so that actually the, the manure was being replaced right back onto the, onto the land, feeding the land. There was, a, there was an implement dealer in this area many years ago. Radio was in its uh, infancy, and he used to advertise Oftentimes, and it was, all the farmers thought it was great fun because he always said, we stand behind all of our implements except our manure spreader. We're passing by the track. Okay. Here we are in front of the schoolhouse. You know, you can't drive New York's roads anywhere. If you get off the main highway, you'll stumble onto these small community buildings that serve so much education for all the people that are leading our country now and those that aren't leading our country but are continuing to make it what it is, the great America. And it's because of the country one-room schoolhouse that we observe that. The last remaining New York State one-room schoolhouse was very near here on Grindstone Island right in the St. Lawrence River just off of Clayton. The building I'm standing in front of is the Timmerman Building. Uh, we're very blessed that the Timmerman family of Lafargeville, New York, has seen to adopt this building and to keep it in great repair. And they have also offered up many of the artifacts that are inside. This is the Timmerman Building. Okay. We have a nice collection of milking machines. We have surge milking machines and delavalent milking machines. They're a little bit different, and they, but they pretty much do the same thing. The surge machine, which is the number one machine in the back, that hangs off the belly of the cow, and there's a, a, a strap that goes around the cow with a metal ring on the bottom, and that, that handle that goes up over the top, this hooks on that ring, and, the, and it hangs off the cow's back. This one, this is the deal of L. This stands between the cows, and you can actually milk two cows at the same time with this one, this unit. They all operate with, uh, with uh, a vacuum. Uh, the vacuum hose comes down here, and it causes them to surge, very much like a calf. Uh, sucking from a cow. It's the same thing. The children, when they come from school, they just love to be able to take an inflation. Um, I had one here. 
here we are. Here's an inflation, and this would go inside of a metal cup like this, not like this, like this. And so these cause that to collapse back and forth. So you, a child will put their finger in there just so you can show, and you go like that, and they will, oh my gosh, I can actually feel it. And that's what causes the cow to give up her milk. It just it takes it away from them. And once again, we have the Dila valve. This will milk two cows at once. This milks one cow at once. This is a one cow unit. And this one also hangs. This is a Dila valve that hangs and probably is used with a pipeline. So you would have a, a, a stainless steel line right above the cow's heads that would go the length of the cow stalls. And you would hook onto the pipeline at each cow's place. Uh, let's see. This is cream separators. This is a group of cream separators. Usually these would be uh, on the home front. You, you, these are not commercial grade. They probably aren't. They might be. But uh, maybe a small creamery may have one like this. Pour the milk in here and crank it. This one's electric, electrified. And it probably was originally electrified. But I see it's got a crank. And this is an interesting thing because it's got a crank with a bell. Well, it looks like a, it looks like a, uh, a bicycle bell. But the, but the purpose of that, as you're cranking, you crank until the bell stops ringing. So you gotta keep going faster and faster until the bell stops ringing. If the bell starts to ring, it's because you're going too slow. So you pick up speed until the bell stops ringing. Centrifugal force causes the P to stay to the outside of the bell. That's what that's for. And you can see there are any number of them. Um, back in a bunch of years ago, the farmers had some union difficulties and a lot of farms were put out of business. Those that weren't put out of business, they would take their milk and, and they would separate it and they would end up making butter at home and they would keep the milk, and they would keep the milk at home until the union strike got over and then they would go back to the business of sending their milk out. But while that was going on, they didn't want to lose their milk, so they would turn it into butter. What else have we got here? Of course, there's any size number of milk cans. These were very popular in the 1800s, in the 19th century. They, they would hold about 104 pounds of milk. And these were the kind that you would often see on the back of a cutter or in a carriage going to the rural farm plant. And these are the kind that were more popular back in from the turn of the century up into the 50s and 60s, up to the advent of bulk tanks. These weighed 94 pounds when they were full, and that was, that was 14 pounds for the, for the can, and 80 pounds of milk went into that. Um, looking off over here, I'm going to cut in front of you, sorry, camera. Uh, this would have been from an old uh, cheese plant, and these would have been um, cheese molds. We would have made, we would have made, that would have been the initial cheese or butter molds. They would go in here, and you can clearly see where they would strain out the cheese curd out of these. And they would set them on, store them, there's a butter bowl here. This is an interesting piece. This would have been a, a home piece, or a small business would be making butter out of this. Once again, it's the same thing. It's got a view hole so you can see when the butter forms in the cream. You just keep doing this, moving it back and forth. It will be sloshing, 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 and it will be a long, arduous process for someone to have to do it. But then suddenly the, separate, the cream would separate and it, it would become butter and buttermilk. And both things are saleable. Buttermilk and butter was very popular. Here's another one, and notice they have a viewpoint on each of them so that you can see just when that is separating. This one is touching something else, so we won't go any further with it. And this is a, this is a rolling barrel. Probably if I roll this, there's, yeah, it's got a lock on it, which is good. So that we have visitors come. They don't get going too fast. These come swinging around. Someone would get hit. This is a pasteurizer, as is this. And 
This, as you can clearly see, is also another butter maker. We would fill the barrel and we would keep rocking it until eventually the cream would separate into, once again, butter and buttermilk. And of course, this is the one that, that is viewed in most films. It's, this is what I did all day Saturday, it was making butter. It would, it would excite, once again, it would excite the cream and eventually, by chugging it up and down, up and down, up and down, this would be a home model that would be made uh, if you weren't sending your milk off to a station to be processed and being sold, you would, make, you, you would turn the milk of one or two cows into the butter for the home. Once again, this is a pasteurizer. And this, this would be a commercial grade uh, butter maker. We would fill this barrel and it would roll and the, the cream would, would topple back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I can see that this one at one point they looked as though they may have wanted to motorize it, so they probably put some kind of an electric motor to that and just turn it on and let it do its own thing. But you could always tell when the, when the butter would form because suddenly it would all form in one end and it would start jumping around because it was heavy on one side and light on the other. We can see here uh, just so much stuff that we would find normally in a creamery, uh, any kind of a creamery, uh, milk bottles, and some of these are local, some of them are not. There's, um, there's butter molds or butter presses as they call them. I'm going to just take a look at them. These are butter molds, and that's open at the top. You would pick it up, turn it over, and that little post would drop down. There's a platform inside, and you would scoop the butter out of this with a scoop. I don't see one readily handy. Um, there's probably one here behind me somewhere. But you would scoop the butter out, and you would put it in that mold and press it down and press it down until the box was full. And then you would roll it over onto a side and push this little pin down, and it would cause a, a brick, a one-pound brick of butter to come out of that. And you would put that on and wrap it up. And that would be a one-pound brick. And that's how they would utilize all that for the store. And there's two of them here. At home, if you were going to be making milk or butter, you'd be using this. And I'm sure that we've all seen these many times. I know when I was a youngster, a couple of times I made butter in this. And you would just crank it, and you would crank it, and you would crank it, and you would spend quite a long time until you were sorry you ever heard about butter. And eventually, magic would happen, and this, this, uh, this cream that you put in here and began the process would just e suddenly get excited and separate. And one, on one side would be the butter and it would cling to the outsides and it would cling to the paddles and then the rest of it would be just buttermilk, which everybody loved to drink. And it was a, a nice home time thing. We would put buttermilk on the table instead of having milk or soda, which is what we drink now, uh, but we drank buttermilk. And so therefore nothing was wasted and even this would have been a home, this would have been used at home. Uh, and you might even take a little bit of cream off of a milk can before you set the milk can off to the station, just so you could make your own butter. We're fortunate that, um, I, don't, I don't know there are any, in New York State, if there are any um, places around where they use milk bottles that are actually glass milk bottles, but we've had several um, companies that did use milk bottles and they gave us their lids off of their milk bottles because they never they knew they wouldn't ever use them anymore so when the kids come from schools we usually let them take a few just so they can take them back and show what they found here at the museum this one is from Mansville New York and of course this one here is from um, uh, Pulaski New York Lakeside Inn in Pulaski and these are all that came off the tops of milk bottles. There's some milk bottles over there. And so this is a butter bowl. You would, if, if you were home and using that butter churn, you would empty it out into here, and then you would take a paddle, and you would keep pressing it and pressing it and pressing it. And as you did that, working it and pressing it, the butter would sweat, and it would lose a lot of the whey that was still residue to the buttermilk. And eventually you press it and press it until no more would it sweat. And then you had pure 
butter, and then you would still have buttermilk coming off of it. This is a commercial uh, operation of the same thing. It's the same idea. It had a crank on it, and it would work its way across. It would actually walk across the butter, and as it went across, it's not in very good repair, but then it probably thought it wouldn't have to do this anymore. But that's what they did. They would put a pile of butter here and keep walking it back and forth across, and it would cause the, the buttermilk or the whey to come out of the butter and go down the ramp. And when they got all done, it would scrape the butter away and you'd have pure butter. And I just can't help but notice this piece is well over 100 years old, and look what good condition the wood is in. It's because it's been impregnated with butter, which is kind of an interesting thought. Placing and installation of the sawmill is pretty much the responsibility of the, of the Proven family. They have been so instrumental in doing so much for the museum, and I'm happy to say that, that this is certainly a testament to their dedication to the museum and this sawmill. This was a family sawmill, and it was no longer being used, and I think that they kind of they moved it over into this direction, and then Jeff Waltz uh, was able to get a hold of this engine through Andre Charleboy, a local veterinary. And between the two of them, they rebuilt this power unit, and they set up this sawmill. And all the lumber that you see in this building, with the exception of the main beams, was actually cut here in this building. Okay. Yeah, here I am again. This is the third of the three large implement sheds. And this one also is, is just crammed right full of wonderful artifacts. And these are things that have been relegated to rest again. And this first piece is a, a buzz saw. We don't see buzz saws anymore, but back in its day, this would have prepared all the wood for the kitchen stove and probably for the parlor stove as well. Um, if this rocks back and forth, it would have a power unit. We would put the wood on it here, and then you would lean, lean it into the saw blade. This would be spinning away, of course, and you'd pull it back off and throw that to the wood pile, slide this down, and repeat the process over and over and over again until you had enough wood all cut up in nice stove-like sizes. Um, we have, uh, of course, right behind me here is yet another uh, thrashing machine. This is one of the oldest thrashing machines we have. I think it was the first one we received that was in galvanized. We have a couple of wooden ones. This was the oldest galvanized one we have. And uh, we, this is not one we use any longer, but it still is a wonderful piece. And I believe it's a McCormick Daring. Is it sitting beside it? It's a rake. And of course, this is a modern piece. Um, I'm not sure exactly why we ended up with this Alice Chalmers plow, but it's been here a while, and uh, it's, it's probably, it looks rather modern, but I know that it's at least 50, 50 60 years old. The next piece is a, is a green drill, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised, but what, it's a, um, uh, uh, what kind is that? Bigford. I guess it's a Bigford. I thought it was an Ontario, but maybe it's a, it's a, it's got at least, it's got three, so it's capable of, of planting three different seeds at the same time. A grass seed, uh, it's got for oats, grass seed and possibly even a fertilizer, and they all, as, this is ground driven, so therefore as these wheels turn, all of the mechanics operate on the bottom and it's constantly dropping seed and it's leaving what we see in any field of wheat or straw. Everything is all laid out in, in rows and, and it looks so neat and tidy, very much like patchwork. This next piece is not, I'm not going to uncover, is a hit and miss engine that, uh, that we use to drive the drag saw. And because it's covered and it's winter's setting on, we're not even going to uncover it. I'm sure we've all seen a drag saw. We're very blessed to have this one. We use it every year. It's a great piece. One more rake. This is the back side. Excuse me, buddy. This is the back side of the hay loader that we looked at earlier that straddles the windrow of hay. The hay comes right through here. 
this this drum of, of fingers cause it to pick up, and these all these these uh, rods are on crankshafts, as you can see, and they're going like this very slowly, and the hay actually gets picked up, shoved up on top of that platform, and it gradually works its way to the top, and then drops off the top and makes a load of hay. And that's what that does. They were really on, uh, they really saved a lot of labor in that people weren't using a fork to pitch the hay up onto the wagon. One person could go out with an intelligent team of horses and they could actually put a load of hay on all by themselves. And back, now once again we are, we're back to the honey wagon. And this is a nice piece. And this is, as, I, as we looked at the one inside, there was in poor shape. This one's in pretty nice condition. We've stored some hay in it. But this also has a moving bed as opposed to a chain that, that fed the manure to the back toward the beaters. This one, the whole bed, as you can see from the bottom, if you, from your vantage point, you can see that the floor moves, the entire floor moves and feeds the manure to the back so it can be distributed out into the field. This is just, of course, like this was the, this was the, uh, the uh, running gear of a Canastota wagon that never, never went west, apparently, and it stayed here, and eventually this was given over to us, probably was a, was a grain cart, so it would have been accustomed to carrying a heavy load and something that was very concentrated. So this would probably have been a grain cart of one sort or another. And we've got an, an early... Um, I've forgotten the name of this. I think that originally, this, this is an Ann Arbor. And I think that eventually the Ann Arbor company on this baler became New Holland. The, and I, the reason, the only reason I say that is because I noticed that the working mechanism is very much the same. And some of the gears are identical to the flywheels and the, and the gear re represent the same as what uh, New Holland used back in the 50s and 60s with their 77s and their super 77s, I think this was a precursor to that, and this was made by the Ann Arbor Machine Company. And this was a baler that baled hay, and a, they, instead of having string, which is what we have now, they used a wire, just like the wire press, or the, the hay press used. They used wire instead of string. And of course, here we have, this is a, a, a railroad depot wagon, and this, this, Lord knows where this came from. I, I probably should investigate more and find out just exactly what depot this represented. Probably someplace on it, there's a, an indication as to where it was, but that's, this is what it was, was a de depot wagon. Piled behind that are three sets of bobsleighs, one, two, three, and once again, they're not often used on the farms any longer, so we were fortunate to get uh, 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 three three sets. Uh, the interesting thing with sleighs, as with most of the older wagons, the way they operated, it was they operated like this. If, if the front turned that way, the back would turn this way, causing the whole wagon to follow along. And that's exactly how they operated. The front ski was attached to the far side of the back ski. So when this turned that way, it would cause the back set back here to turn this way. And so they, they followed in the same tracks, and they pulled easier. They use those a lot for logging, and they use those a lot for coming in out of the woods, bringing wood out, bringing winter wood out. They were called bobsleighs, and they also used them on the roads before the roads were plowed on a regular basis. They would use bobsleighs, but that was the beauty of them was they always followed the rear bobsled, followed in the front bobsled's tracks, and so there was only one set of tracks. This is a drag saw. Drag saw? Nope. This is a this is a small this is a small portable sawmill. There's a blade here, and I don't think we have used this. We I don't think we've ever fired this up. It's a piece that we have gotten, but it, it, it's so heavy that we don't move it around an awful lot. So it's 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 a it's a it's a saw, and it's for make it's a it's a portable sawmill, and it's it's a small one. Once again, we have a new Racine thrashing machine back there. And as I said earlier on in this video, thrashing machines are like elephants. One is more than enough. 
nowadays, but we've got five or six, and, and they're wonderful to have. The interesting thing with getting so many uh, thrashing machines is if you, if you owned a thrashing machine, you took care of it because it was a major piece of equipment. You took care of it, you always kept it inside, and now that they're no longer used, we find ourselves with five of them. And of course, this is a, a farming buckboard. You would see these, you see them in westerns a lot. You'll see uh, the farmers scooting around, putting hay on and stuff and, and whatnot. And when we have farmer boy days, we have oftentimes have a, uh, one of the board members would bring his team of horses over and we attach to this and we give the children rides in it. And so it's, it's really a, a nice piece and, uh, and, and the kids really enjoy the rides. This is a drag saw. Uh, once again, the same thing applies with this piece. We don't use it often because it's such a big piece, but uh, it does work well. And uh, it, we hook a tractor to it, any kind of a tractor that's got a belt fully. And it'll, what happens is, is you put the log in here on this trolley, and this trolley locates on this, which lays on the ground over there. And this saw just goes back and forth, back and forth, cutting off firewood, block wood. So you would, that's all it's for, is it's, it's, it's to cut off block wood. You would take this out in, right out into the forest and cut down the logs and then feed them right onto that, hook it up, and it would, it would cut your block wood so that you could load it onto a wagon, not this one, but maybe a, a working wagon, and, and bring the block wood to the, to the winter house and be ready to block it up and, and to split it up for the, for the kitchen.